Right, let's get to it. Test tomorrow. If you need into my flex today, you know how to do all that. If you're in with another teacher already, just let me know, let them know. Hopefully you can work out something where you can maybe get out today, get in here and then get with them tomorrow. Something like that. I don't know. It's up to you. Yeah. Okay. So for number one, part A, here is our domain scanner. And as we scan from left to right, you can all see that the uh, the domain goes from negative infinity because it goes forever to the left to positive infinity. So for your domain, and remember you're grading this now, it's not like you're doing this for the, for the first time, right? So, can I write? That's the question. Oh, gotcha. That's... Uh, so for your domain, you should have a negative infinity to positive infinity interval. Right. You should have this practice test from yesterday. Is anyone not here yesterday? You guys will need a copy of this. It was, of course, on Canvas, but I know better. What were you going to? Okay. Yep. And for the range, we have to have a different scanner. I don't know why I can't change colors. This thing's kind of honestly freaking me out here a little bit. There we go. So we need a different scanner for the range. Our range scanner, remember, goes from low to high. So when we scan for the range, we're scanning from the bottom up to the top. And you can see that this graph starts when we go from the bottom at negative infinity, and it stops right here at 3. So remember, when you scan range, you're looking sideways for the graph's vertical nature like where does it exist and so for our range we should have um, negative infinity and then it should end at three and because it does reach a height of three we would want to square bracket that interval remember that the square bracket indicates that we get there like it in, it's included right and the only other thing we have to do is state if it's a function and this clearly passes the vertical line test the graph never exists above or below itself. And so we would just answer, yeah, this one's a function. So I just wrote, I just write function like that. Boom. So those are the three components of each answer on the first page. Give the domain, give the range, state whether or not it's a function. Okay. Uh, question number, well, letter B, I suppose. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, same idea here. When I scan it with a vertical line, I scan looking at the x coordinates. I see that it goes forever to the left and forever to the right. So my domain should be all, uh, well, I'm not going to say it that way. The domain is a negative infinity to positive infinity. And the range is the same thing because this graph goes forever to the low. So it never like starts or stops at the bottom and it also goes forever to the high those arrowheads that you see on your test are indicative of that foreverness so it should also go from negative infinity to positive infinity and yes it is a function by the way here in about an hour there'll be an answer key posted on canvas i have it i just haven't published it yet because i wanted to get a recording up there but if you want to go back and look at any of this again you're welcome obviously you got 24 hours to do that well, 23 hours and 54 minutes or something like that. We good? Any questions on that one? Okay. Down here to part C, and I don't have the arrows on this one. I had to draw those in by hand. So this one does have an arrow here, and it did have a colored in circle here. So this one is going to have some infinity about it, but not completely on both sides. So when we start with the domain, Again, I just, you can't stress this enough uh, if you haven't gotten the memo yet. This is how we scan for domain. We scan from left 
loop to right. And when we talk about the left side, the graph begins at negative infinity. So for your domain, you all should have opened it with a negative infinity. And it does conclude at a certain x value. You see that the graph's existence ceases right there, correct? And so the domain ends at whatever x coordinate that is, and that is positive 3. Okay, so our domain goes from negative infinity to positive 3. The range, we turn sideways now and we change our scanner is now a horizontal line because we're scanning sideways. And so the domain this time does not exist down here in Foreverland, but it does begin right here at negative three and it does end never at infinity. So we're gonna have a, a range that goes from negative infinity, oh, excuse me, from negative three to positive infinity like that. Oh, and I should have had a square bracket around my negative three. I apologize for that. I'll fix that for you. So, any questions so far? Yeah, man. <clears throat> yeah, well, I don't know why I put a round bracket there either. So, thanks, buddy. You gotta, you gotta watch me this morning. Yeah, apparently it's gonna be one of those days, huh? Thank you, Jackson. Yes, there should, of course, be a square bracket. You're right. Okay, we want square brackets to cap these domains and ranges off because the point that it kind of ends at or starts at, depending on how you think of that, they it's an inclusive point. So yeah, thanks, Jackson. All right, for question D, the domain and range scanners again. So if I have a vertical scanner like this, I just keep drawing this because I hope it gets stuck in your head. I mean, I hope, you know, scan left to right. I know I say left to right and I draw a vertical line because vertical lines are what scan the x-axis like this. So I'm using a vertical scanner to look at the x numbers and the graph begins right here at negative five. And the graph exists and exists and exists and it ceases to exist at negative one. So your domain, everybody, should have gone for this problem from square bracket negative five up until and including square bracket negative one. Again, all we care about with domain are x values. We don't care about how high or low the graph is. Now. Just looking at sidewaysness. Mm -hmm. I don't know why we like square if it's included. Like if it that point is there. Round if it doesn't get there. Oh. Okay, you're going to see a lot of square brackets with domains and ranges. F Y I, and again. Mr. Predictable here, we're going to the range, so I'm going to change my scanner to be one of these guys, and I'm because I'm looking sideways. This is not an infinite sort of thing, okay? It begins existing at this y value, which is negative 2, and it ceases to exist at this y value, which is positive. That's it. That's all there is to it. Range is low to high. So my range values, my range domain, or excuse me, my range interval is going to be from down at negative 2 stopping up at positive four. All right, and I did not answer this on the previous ones. Let's go back real quick. Um, was question C, is that a function? C is definitely, yes, a function. It passes, we're talking about C now, the one before, because I forgot to. We all agree this passes the vertical line test, part C. So I kind of forgot to say that, that's my bad. Having a rough morning, apparently. So yes, this is a function. And then let's head up to problem B. Was B a function? Oh, we already answered that. Yes, it is. So, all right. Let's look at D. Does D pass the vertical line test? No, it fails miserably, doesn't it? Uh, the only place it would pass it is right there and right here, right? But anywhere in between, you see that the graph constantly is getting hit twice by the same vertical line. So this one is not a function. So all I would write for that is just not a function. Piece of cake. Please do not write yes and no, okay? Function, not a function. All right, let's head down to E. And on your graph, you have circles, again, that I don't have here because I couldn't make them on the computer. So there is a circle here and there is a circle here. And those are both inclusive because they are colored in. So again, my domain is simply going to be starts over here at right there and it ends right here where those little arrows are pointing. So for your domain, everybody, you should have a 
set an interval from negative six ending at positive seven. Good. You've got to ask if you're not sure, right? I assume, like I told you yesterday, I assume you're done with this and that you're not seeing this for the first time. You're more grading your paper, not, not doing it for the first time. Uh, the range is going to be a low to high concept and the lowest y value that the graph ever achieves is right there where that red arrow is pointing and the highest y value it ever achieves is right there. So it's just a simple matter of looking at the coordinates and these ones are a little hard to see. <clears throat> I knew when I printed this that those numbers are pretty small but you got good young eyes. If you don't you got glasses right. So that's way down at negative eight and it ceases up here at positive two. So our range should be an interval that begins down at negative eight and ends up at positive two. Is number letter E a function? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. It passes the vertical line test with flying colors. Okay, and then finally, let's look over at question F. Uh, yours has uh, arrows, well, one arrow here and an inclusive point here, bless you. So when we scan with our vertical line, here's our domain scanner. How far to the left does this graph go? Negative infinity, right? Some people would say, well, what about this point right here? I don't care about that point because I'm just looking for where does the graph exist, right? I, this point means nothing to me in the scheme of the domain. I just have to look at it and say, how far left does the graph make? And the bottom line is it keeps going. So it is negative infinity on the left. And if I scan to the right and I go beep, 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 and I scan, it begins, it stops right there. So our domain should run from negative infinity until zero, like that. The range, I switch, I go sideways now, I do a horizontal line so that I can see y-axis values. You can't see y-axis values with a vertical line, but you can with a horizontal scan. So my line, I begin down here and I say, I don't see any graph, I don't see any graph, I don't see any graph. The graph begins existence right here. And it ends how high? Positive infinity. This graph goes, you could move this thing upwards for a million years <clears throat> and the graph is gonna continue to be up there with you. So the, the range has a starting bottom point, but it has a never ending top. So. For the range, we should have uh, negative two as a beginner and definitely positive infinity for an ender. Is that one a function? No way, fails the vertical line test. You can see it right anywhere in this region where I'm moving that red line, that's a fail, 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 fail. Those are all fails. You say, well, it passes over here, whoop de doo right? If it fails anywhere, it's not. A Any questions on page one? Right. Let's get to page two. And I don't think we didn't, did we go over these specific questions yesterday? Yeah. Okay, we're, we'll practice those some more. Since this was on yesterday's recording, I'm not going to re-record it. I assume everyone who needed it would have already watched it. So, um, I'll, but I'll practice problems like that more with you here in a little bit when we're done with this whole test. Okay, so we'll go back over that just to make sure you're good to go. So on question three, <clears throat> First off, how many intervals do you see? Yeah, that's what I see. I see four. And I color coded them. You'll see it on the answer key when I post it. But I like to color code them as, you know, a green interval to me just feels green. We should associate with going up, right? Uh, and red should generally feel like I'm going down. And so the green intervals are the increasing intervals you see. And then I also have a couple of red intervals from here to here and here to here. So all like you gotta, like this ain't your first rodeo, you know what to do. So we're gonna name the intervals. So I like to do the increasing intervals first, don't know why. So I'm gonna say, it's a bad color, but I'll live with it. I'm gonna say increasing over, and here we go. I'm gonna just simply name the intervals. You should be really good at intervals by now. How far left does that first green interval go? This one over here, how far left does it go? Yeah, it's negative infinity. You gotta 
forget Y values. Remember, when we talk about intervals, I don't give a douche about the Y values. I just care about the domain values. The intervals, as I travel sideways along the x-axis, where is the interval defined? And that green interval is defined from negative infinity up until what? Negative one. Again, we're not looking at the number three. It could be up at a million, and I just couldn't care less. I'm just interested in the x-ness of it, the sidewaysness of it, right? But I have another increasing interval as well, and it's this one that I'm super vandalizing right here. Like that one is another increaser. And so I also have an interval that goes from where to where? One to three. One to three. And remember, you know, this is a discussion that we had a long time ago, but we use round brackets for stuff like this just because at the ends of the intervals, technically the graph is not increasing at the end. Remember, when it gets to that end, it's not increasing and it's not decreasing. For an infinitely small moment in time, it's doing neither of those two. It's just flat. Does that make sense? That's why we want to use the round ones in a case like this. Okay. And then I'm going to switch colors and we're going to do the decreasing intervals. And so we're going to say that the graph is the function is decreasing over. And again, I've just got two red intervals. One of them runs from here to here. And I simply define that again by the x-ness of it. Don't pay any mind to how highs and lows they are. We don't care. So where is that from? Where where from and where to? Negative That's all. Negative one to one, comma, and then I have a second interval from where to where. You got it. That's all there is. There's not a lot of meat on that particular bone, if, unless I'm mistaken. I believe this question, yeah, just state the intervals for which it's doing those things. So that's it. Any questions there? All right, let's get to page three. And on page three, we're going to begin by just doing some basic math. Um, the first questions revolve around this function. And the function, remember, is everything is based on what I just put in a red box. That's, if you recall, that's called the function rule. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where everything is happening. And so if, if I say to you, find f of four, then you simply take the number four and put it in place of all the x's. You are, of course, required to show work. Even, listen, you're at the point, if a test, if a teacher, a test writer doesn't say, please show your work, I'm sorry, you still got to do it. Like, people are interested in this. Like, I need to know. I mean, I hope that Hagen gets everything right. But if something goes wrong, I got to have that work to look back at and say, oh, I see what he did. Like, that, but that's where I can give you partial credit. Right? So I speak for all math teachers. If we, for, you know, we don't type, please show your work neatly, you still got to do it. So when I put four in place of the X's, it would look like this. Four squared minus seven times four plus 11. What'd that take me? Four seconds? Easy. Now I got to do math. What's four squared? 16 minus what's seven times four? And then from here, you can pretty much just plow it left to right. Remember, there is no addition before subtraction garbage. We left to right these suckers. What's 16 minus 28? Negative 12. And what's negative 12 plus 11? Negative. Our answer for this problem is negative 1. And I got the work to back it up. For f of negative 3, you know, second verse, same as the first. Here we go. I'm going to do x squared, note the parentheses, muy importante, minus seven times negative three plus 11. And again, we're always at that point where we hope either A, that you've got decent basic skills or that you, of course, at least know how to use a calculator well. What is negative three squared? It is not negative nine. It is positive nine. 100% of the time, it's going to be positive. You're squaring something up. What's the second part? Negative seven times negative three. Positive 21. You're okay. Plus 11. So we got a whole bunch of positives here. What's nine plus 21? What's 30 plus 11? 41. And then of course the three points on the house. No thanks necessary. F of zero is really just a matter of 
Um, and honestly, here I am contradicting myself. I don't feel like this is one where you should be required to show work. What happens to a function when you put zero in place of X? Mm. Yeah, everything just goes away, except for the part that doesn't have an X. 11, I'm going to circle him in purple for you. 11 is immune to the power of zero. 11's like, go ahead, but I'm, you can't change me. I'm a, I'm a constant. But if you put zero in place of these X's over here, they're like gone, gone. The answer is just 11. You don't show work on something like that. I get it. I, I think I speak for all math teachers when I say that would be okay. Any questions there? All right. So that's just the basic mechanics of putting numbers in and then working math and getting an answer out. Then we get to something a little bit more abstract, but we practiced the dickens out of this one. We've got two functions. Neither one of them is a quadratic. They're both linear functions, piece of cake. And I just want you to compose f of g of 7. What do we do first? You got to do g first. Remember, the second thing we say is the first thing we do. And so I'm going to do g of 7 first. And so g of 7 looks like this. Here it goes. Here's my function rule for g. I put a purple box around it for your educational convenience. Negative 3 times 7 plus 4. What's negative 3 times 7? What is negative 21 plus 4? Um, 100% of the time, it's negative 17. Always has been, always will be. But interestingly enough, remember that that answer, that output now becomes our new input. And so the next problem says to do F of your answer. That's what it means. So F of negative 17. So now I have to do F of negative 17. You see, you got to get the answer to the inside part before you can use it to find the answer of the outside part. And f of negative 17 is just 3 times negative 17 minus 5. 3 times negative 17 is probably outside our comfort zone for a lot of us, but that's negative for sure, 51. And what's negative 51 down 5? Negative 5, 6. Yeah, so that's our final answer. Any questions on how to compose those like that? Second one we say, first one we do. Got it? We went over this one as a class yesterday. So again, if you want to see that again, just go back to yesterday's recording. Yesterday's recording was short. It was like nine minutes long or 10 minutes long or something. Like that. So, and we'll practice that some more too. Don't worry. All right, so that's just putting 6x minus 1 in place of all the x's and the f function. And then that leads us down to problem six, and then we'll have a whole bunch of time to practice all this stuff I think we need to practice. So uh, again, I said this yesterday, I'm sorry to ask you to do this, but I'm going to do it with you. So just deal. We have to make a table. So when I make a table, I just do this. I always draw X, and then I make a line, and then I make Y, and I make a line. Simple way to make a table. And then I'm going to throw my X values, these guys, down along the left side. So 1, negative 2, negative 5, negative 8. And then I'm going to throw my y values, that's these green guys, down along the right side. So I got 3, 5, 7, and 9. Now all that's left for me to do is some basic counting. Boy, do I hope I can do that. I've had a rough morning. I haven't messed up in like 12 minutes, knock on wood. Wish me luck. I've made a mistake since 8 o'clock. It's been like 17 minutes. Here we go. Hope I can count. How does 1 become negative 2? You do subtract 3. How does negative 2 become negative 5? You do it again. And how does negative 5 become negative 8? Good. Now we're going to do it on the right-hand side, because what we're looking for here are the consistent slopes, right? The comparisons of the y and the x changes as we go. How does 3 become 5? How does 5 become 7? And how does 7 become 9? Good. And what we're really after here, listen, I know that you can look at this right now and say, yeah, it's a linear function, but do note this. I'm going to put a box around it for you. Please explain your answers. Um, this one is pretty important to all of us. 
at any level, teachers, admin, state department, we want to know that you understand why this is linear. And the reason why it's linear is because the slope never changes. That's what makes a straight line is that the slope from this point to this point is the same as the slope from this point to this point and the same as from this point. Like that's what we want you to get for real. So all I'm going to say for my explanation is I'm going to say, yeah, it's linear. And as far as my explanation goes, I think what I put on mine, I don't, I don't, you can see it later, but I wrote something like uh, the slope never changes. You can write something like that. Or you could write the slope is constantly, look at this, negative two thirds, negative two thirds, negative two thirds. Remember, slope is a comparison of how much does my y change to how much does my x change. So that's where these numbers, the purple numbers on the side come in so handy is that they enable us to see the actual slopes. Any questions on that one? Okay, and again, I know you could eyeball part B and say, you know, it's, we already know it's not linear, but we gotta go through the process here. So let's get to it, let's make a table. So my X's make a line, my Y's, and then X's will go down the left-hand side. So one, two, three, four. And then my Y's will go down the right-hand side, which are eight, four, two, one. And there is a pattern, isn't there? You see it. You don't have to be a math mathematician. You see it's divided by two, right? But that's not linear. That's something else. So, but let's let's verify this so that we can justify ourselves. When I go from here to here and here to here and here to here, it is plus one every single time, isn't it? That's good. That's consistent. But when I I can't do that for the right side because it change it keeps changing. So I got to think of things in terms of plus and minus. I'm going to say that again because we're at the point where your brain has tuned you out. I'm going to say it again. You have to do these based on plus and minus. You cannot consider the changes as times are divided. They must be plus or minus as we travel from one point to the next. So you're not allowed to say, I, and I'm and I'm with you, like it divides by two, but I can't say that. I need to say that it decreased by four. And then how does four become two? It decreased by two. And how did two become one? It decreased by one. And you can see that the slope is going to change every single time. That's like, that's, it can't work that way. I mean, it can, but it's not a straight line. So plus one, plus one, plus one. And as I draw these circles again, I want you to tell me what the slopes are. What is this slope? What is Y over X in this case? Other way, bro. Y over X. The slope right there is negative four. So at that point in time, the slope of that curve, you'll talk about this in calculus, the slope at that exact point in time is like between those two points, the slope is negative four. But when we get to this one, look at my purple numbers. What's the slope? Put your Y whoop, over your X. What do you get? You do get negative two. Do it again. What's the slope down here? And you see that the slope is constantly changing, right? That means it's not a straight line can't be a straight line and have different slopes at different places, right? Doesn't work that way. So this one, I would say, not linear. And you could write that one word like we did yesterday. You could write non-linear as one word. I don't care. And my explanation this time is the slope changes. Slope cannot change on a straight line. That's what makes a line straight is the fact that it doesn't. Good. So at this point, we're going to do some more practice problems. And I feel like this this will help us to get ready to, uh, for the test. And then if I, like if I realize you're good to go, then I'll just give you some time here in a little bit to maybe just work on your notes or something like that. So uh, the first thing I want to practice is uh, question, is it five? Yeah, question five, part B. So in question five, part B, what we have, is we'll have a function. Like this, and you will, by the way, have another function over here, but for the sake of what I'm going to talk about right now, and actually we can do both. Uh, we're not going to use this one right away, but let's just make up a function for G like 
me 2x plus 7. Something like that. Good. So here's what I want you guys to help me do. And I want you to do this on your paper. All right? It's better if you do it. And then you'll stay awake. You won't get so sleepy and, and uh, want to doze off because you'll be actively writing things down. It helps helps to stay awake. Kill two birds, one stone. You'll learn more and you'll stay awake. I know. You look wide awake, buddy. So let's do f of 2x minus 1. I realize we've only done this once together, so you might be looking at me like, I don't know what to do. We did this yesterday. Okay. So remember, fundamentally, a function says, I will tell you what to put in place of all my x's. It's very bossy. And it, what it says to you is, first off, use the function named f. Okay, so let's write down the function named f. He is negative 4 input minus 3. That just came from right up above. And then the function being bossy bridges says put this. This is my input. He says put this in place of my old x. Where there used to be an x, let it go. It's okay. It's someone opening a drink. It's okay. We've heard that before. Ridiculous. So... I'm going to change that blank where the X used to be into what's in the red box. I'm simply going to put 2X minus 1 right there. Remember, we're used to just putting numbers in there. You can put whatever you want. It's okay. Any questions so far? You sure? And then we just do some real basic five months ago kind of algebra 101 stuff. So I'm going to take my negative 4. And I'm going to distribute it to here and to here. What's negative 4 times 2x? Negative 8x. And what's negative 4 times negative 1? And then I copy down the minus 3. And what's what's 4 minus 3? Four. So I have negative 8x plus 1. Listen to it. good let's practice that again and this time i'm not going to do it i'm going to write it up here and i'm going to let you guys work it out so here we go i want you guys to please all of you that means everybody i want you all to do f of negative x minus four go for it and when you get an answer i would like to hear what you think it is and i'll write it on the board and then we can do the whole What's right? What's wrong? If I was wrong, what did I do wrong? What do you think it is, Landon? According to Landon, the answer is 4x plus 13. I don't know if it's right or wrong. I haven't worked it yet. So you you agree? Okay, good. Give you a few more seconds. If you get anything different, let me know. So what this is saying to me is take the function named f, which is negative 4 input minus 3, and change that input to say negative x minus 4. I'm just throwing it in like this. Mm -hmm. And then I just got to do some basic math here. What's negative 4 times negative x? 4x. And what is negative 4 times negative 4? Plus 16. And then I combine my like terms and I get that. You feel like you understand that? Yeah. That's wonderful news. Okay, let's do a different thing with these two functions. While we've got it up here, and then we'll get to that linear, not linear stuff. We'll have plenty of time. I'd like you guys, and we'll do this game again where I'm not going to do it with you. I want you guys to do f of g of negative 3. Same game. Once you get an answer, say it. I'll write it. I mean, 
ideally everyone in the room gets the same answer and it's right. But that's okay if it's not. That's what today is for, is working out those kinks. I have an answer, negative seven, but I would accept others if you disagree. You're doing F of G of negative three. You have to do two math problems to survive these. You begin by doing the second one, which is G of negative three, and then you take the answer to that and plug it into F, get your final answer. That should be in your notes, right? Like, I know that I my job is not perfect. I know that it's hard to teach teenagers. It's hard to get all kids to make good notes. But that's something I would put in my notes. If you say it second, you do it first. Just write that in quotes. And then when you, you hear yourself say this, F of G of negative three. I said G second, so I'm going to do that first. So... Let's see how Landon did, how the rest of you did. I'm going to begin by doing this math problem in the purple box. It's unavoidable. I have to do G of negative 3, which means to take the function name G, which is 2 inputs plus 7, and change his input into negative 3. And 2 times negative 3 yeah. is negative 6, which plus 7, man, I hope it's 1, right? So now what this really means is I'm going to replace up here g of negative 3 with just the answer to what it was, which in this case is 1. So now I have to do f of my answer, f of 1, which is negative 4 times my input minus 3. And what's my input? 1. one. And what's negative 4 times 1? And what's negative 4 minus 3? Jackpot. So anyone, I mean, this is your chance. I mean, you have other chances. You have flex and you could stay after school if you're bashful, but this is a great chance for you just to, to ask if you'd like a little bit more practice on that, if you're a little unsure. Okay, so you guys are good on the double function part? Yeah. Dope. All right, let's get back then to number two. And number two was the thing that we just kind of brushed past yesterday. And I'm going to put a function on the board and I want you to tell me if it's linear or not linear. And then I want you to be able to tell me why. So this, by the way, in case you're, you know, it's hard to just keep listening when I drone on. This is all now going to be uh, uh, applicable to problem number two, where it asks you to determine if the function is linear or not linear. Explain your answers. So. I noticed that none of you spoke right away, and I appreciate that. That means that you are doing some math, right? You're trying to do exactly what I told you to do yesterday. Jackson, have you arrived at a conclusion? You think it's linear? Yeah. Why do you make that claim? Yeah, good. Excellent listening from yesterday. You guys nailed it. So remember, if I, can, if I want to prove that something is linear, I'm going to see if I can make it look like this. I'm going to write it in red up here in the corner. Remember from yesterday, if I can make it look like that, score. I'm in. And so I'm going to leave the 4y where he's at. I'm going to add the 3x to the other side, giving me 4x. And then, of course, I'm going to divide everything by 4. I'm on a mission for like the 700th time this year to get y by itself. We do this a lot in math, get y by itself. So we get y equals 1x plus 1 over 2. There it is, y equals mx plus b. Bingo, bango, and d. Okay, so that one I would say is linear. Uh, and honestly, as far as explanation goes, again, as I said yesterday, my explanation can be this. Look, I got y equals mx plus b. Okay, let's do another one. Yeah, I mean, you should already be shaking your head. 
And honestly, I don't even think I need to get Y by itself on this one. I did that and I went through the motions yesterday. But now that we kind of understand it, we're, we're like, I don't need to finish this to know what causes the issue. Right. Remember that we learned two rules yesterday that make something not linear. One of them is you can't have exponents, right? As soon as you throw exponents into functions and equations, you get curves, things that bend and curve. And that's it's not linear. This isn't about, is it a function? It's about, is it linear? And the fact that this exists, that's all the explanation I need, right? So I would say that this one is nonlinear or not linear. Again, you choose your verbiage. And as far as an explanation is concerned, just draw a little arrow and say, bam, I got your explanation right there. Okay. There cannot be exponents in a function for it to be a straight line. It's going gonna, it's gonna to curve. So if we automatically know it's not like you know, we don't have to like, even follow it down. No, no. The ones, the, the reason I, it's a good question, Addie. The reason I solved this one down is because then I can use this as my explanation, right? Mm -hmm. I like that. Kind of kill two birds with one stone there. I see it and I can use it as my explanation. What about this one? Right. And this one, you cannot stop right now and, and say no. I agree with you, by the way. If you're great listeners and you pick this up, you know already that this one is not. But we have to, bless you, we have to verify this. So we're going to go through the steps so that we can put on paper our proof of our statement, our, our justification of our claim that this is not a straight line. So I'm going to first start by just trying to get Y by itself. I'm going to go through those motions. So I'm going to move a whole bunch of stuff to the right hand side. The term that I want to isolate first off is the one in this red cloud. The red cloud is important because it contains my precious y. Okay, so I'm going to begin by just leaving 4xy, like you sit, stay. I'm going to move the 6x to the other side, make him positive. I'm going to add the 2 to the other side, and 3 plus 2 is 5. All right, step one, clean house, get all that garbage to the other side. And this is where the revelation sort of comes in. What do we have to do to get y by itself? We divide everything by 4x. And it's at that point that you realize that, you know, Houston, we have a problem. So these 4x's over here are going to cancel out. And we say, we're done, mission accomplished. But uh, like this part right here, do you see how those x's wash out? They cancel, don't they? That's kind of, that's kind of cool. But not really that interesting because what's unavoidable is the fact that at the end of this, I get 1 over x. And what rule did I just break? x is not allowed to be in the denominator of the fraction. It creates what we call a rational function, which is one of those funky double curvy things like yesterday that I showed you. And so I would say in this case that this is not linear. And as far as a justification is concerned, again, I'll just point to that, circle it, say, I got your justification right there. There cannot be exponents and there cannot be um, variables, the X's in the bottom of the <clears throat> Do you guys understand that concept? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have about eight minutes. I'll ask you a couple of questions here. First question is this. Is there anything else on that practice test that I can go over with you to ensure that you all get A's? You sure? Yes, ma'am? Which this? Oh, this, this first page? Uh-huh. It, it never stops. Are we on the same problem here? Mm -hmm. It just, this, this line is, and I'm going to stop the recording. Just give me one second. Okay.